What's up, Gold Miners? In today's episode, I have the honor of interviewing Joss Janis, a 23-year-old real estate investor who is absolutely crushing the game as a real estate investor and as a real estate agent. I have to admit, this is one of the better episodes that I've ever had. I learned a lot from this guy and I just, I'm, I'm flabbergasted. I think that he is super impressive and what he's doing at such a young age is phenomenal. And we go deep into some of the things that he is doing right now, including a full deep dive on Josh's hybrid wholesaling methodology. And towards the end of the episode, he gives a step-by-step -step guide on how he pieces together every single deal he does utilizing this hybrid wholesaling methodology. It's brilliant. And I think that what he's doing should be shouted from the rooftops and so much that agents and investors alike can learn from this episode. So without further ado, everyone, let's welcome to the show, Josh Janis. Josh, welcome to the gold mine. Thanks for the invite, Danny. I appreciate it. Dude, you know, I, uh, absolutely, absolutely. I, um, I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking about how I first came across your stuff because I've been following you online for a, a little bit of time here and you had a really successful episode. Am I right? With, with bigger pockets. That's kind of how you started in the, like the, you guys had like a, a pretty successful podcast episode, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I kind of came from that in terms of my growth. Yep. Yeah. So walk me through this man because you were i don't know how many years old but you were young you're driving doordash and now you are a very experienced real estate investor and all of this has happened in a very short amount of time so kind of walk me through what inspired you to take that step into the world of real estate uh given you know where you were at and like what inspired that change for you um, when you, uh, when you like decided this is going to be it for sure. Around four years ago, I was, you know, door dashing. <clears throat> I was just taking community college classes and I wanted to, you know, I had some money saved up from some of my side hustles, building duct tape wallets, selling shoes, et cetera. And I wanted to figure out what to do with it. And, you know, I, I stumbled across real estate as a potential idea to house hack and, you know, live in one unit, rent out the other idea. Um, that led me to bigger pockets, right? Because that's a really good resource to, you know, find information regarding finding investment properties, find the right agent, et cetera. And, you know, that led me to a local brokerage, uh, Remington Lyman, who I met in person after meeting him on the forums. And then that's where I'm at today. That's kind of how it started. You make it sound so easy, but we know it wasn't. And so what what challenges did you face in that transition? from DoorDash driver uh, into making income in real estate. I know that you had a stint. I'm not sure if you still do, but I know that you had a stint as a realtor. You were, you were, you were making sales as well, correct? So uh, how, how, how did you overcome the adversity and what adversity and challenges did you face in that transition period? For sure. So I started in um, September of 21, doing it roughly full time along with balancing school. I was doing a lot of cold calling to try to find off-market properties. I wanted to learn how to talk real estate, you know, learn about the owners and given areas that I was targeting, learn about, you know, the prices and rents and sales comparables, who's motivated, who isn't. And that's a lot of time and it's a lot of no money yet. So I spent a good, you know, four months calling 20 to 40 hours a week, not really making any money, trying to figure this game out, juggling classes and juggling DoorDash at night. And, you know, that was challenging. Um, I closed my first deal around like four months in. That's why I decided to go all in. I stopped, you know, well, all in with school, a little bit of school still. And I stopped doing DoorDash. I was just calling a lot more. And uh, I experienced my second level of, you know, really tough times to be honest, because I put right around 10 deals in contract with some of the buyers that I had found on Bigger Pockets forums, along with you know, the off-market deals that I was calling sellers from. And my first 10 deals fell out in my first three months of having my license. And that was a killer because I, you know, I worked really hard connecting those two people. I obviously didn't know what I was doing very well then. So it was a little rough. I had to learn the hard way, but yeah. A, yeah. So I don't know if you know much about my background, but I, um, I was a realtor and then I grew my real estate team 
uh, at one point had 35 agents working with me. And so I know what it's like to kind of climb that hill. And, 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 you know, it's interesting because 10 deals falling apart, that sounds like a lot, but like th- that, that could happen to anyone. Um, obviously the experience does play a part in it. The question, so the, the, one of the things that comes up a lot, a lot on this podcast, I have a lot of guys that, that previously were in sales. I think a lot of pe- people who are in or uh, are, are real estate investors, successful real estate investors have some sort of sales background. I'm curious how much of that rejection that you experienced early on in your career, because if you're calling 40 hours a, a week, people don't realize how many no's you hear and how many people are like super messed up to you on the phone, you know, say every, like say all these nasty things to you. How did that experience shape your eventual success and who you became as, as an investor? Yeah. You know, I took all those no's and, you know, a lot of my friends went to four year colleges or, you know, and I was taking community class colleges driving DoorDash. I did not feel like I was on top of the world by any means. I was just trying to hustle, trying to put things together and decided to start cold calling. And I was getting rejection after rejection constantly. And I really learned to figure out like, don't focus on what you want when you pick up the phone, kind of focus on what the other person wants and see if you can actually provide them a solution. And I think that's really the biggest lesson that I learned cold calling a ton in the beginning is, you know, okay, maybe they don't want to sell now, but maybe they know someone that does, or they want to buy something in this area, or they need a new property manager or something. And, you know, if you can be the solution to a lot of their problems, you're going to, you're going to be there for the problems that you do want to solve. You know, if you're a realtor, you want to help them buy and sell a home and you'll be that guy. When I was, uh, you're what, 23? 23. 23. Okay. So I, when I, I got into real estate when I was your age, so you are already well ahead of where I was, which is awesome, dude. That I think that's so sick. Like the, I think the internet has really just provided this, um, this, uh, this parody to the game where anyone, you know, northwards of like 16 years old can really start making, uh, like a massive amount of, uh, of money and, and creating a, a, a foundation of success for themselves. So t- hats off to you, man, for, for doing everything that you've done up until this point. And, um, you know, I think when I was around your age, right. So it was like 23 years old is when I got into it. And one of the first uh, podcasts that I listened to uh, when I was studying for my real estate exam, I, there was this guy, I don't remember the episode. I don't remember the guy. I don't remember anything. But what I do remember is this one line and it's, it mirrors the sentiment that you just, uh, that you just described, which is, he said, find a need, fill a need. The most successful uh, salespeople find the need and they fill a need. And what you just said right now, find what other people want and offer a solution is the same thing, you know? And so, it's so true. Like you're trying to, you know, sales, a lot of people think of sales as like pushing your agenda onto other people. But if you can figure out what their agenda is and then reverse engineer how you can help them, you're going to have a lot more success, not just in sales, because, but like in every aspect of your life, because as I'm sure that you found out, investing is sales. Oh yeah. It's the mm-hmm. same game, just different pieces. 100%. So let's walk back to that first deal. What was that first investment like? Definitely. So that was around six months into being a full time agent. Um, I had built up a good amount of savings through selling. I built, I you know, I picked up the pace pretty quickly, and I bought a deal as just a straight Burr duplex. Mm-hmm. You know, the Burr method: buy, renovate, refinance, repeat. Um, I think I missed an R in there. Oops. But uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> people know at this point. Um, I think you got. Yeah. I think you got it. Yeah. 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 yeah it was I paid eighty k. I put you know. 40k into it that was the original plan the contractor that i lined up to do the job didn't look at the addict then to notice that there was electric live electrical wires sitting on the wood framing up nice. top which is uh surprise place didn't burn down but you know i had to rewire it so that was a little expensive didn't learn a lot of lessons regarding contractors you know when to pay them how to check for references etc that was my big lesson there so let's talk about the financing for that deal because I'm sure that someone is listening to this episode right now who is kind of in the same position that you were in back then. How old, like 19, 18, 20? How old were you when that happened? Yeah, that was uh, 18 months ago. It was actually okay, not so, that long ago. So like 20, you were like 21? Yeah, 21. 
Okay. 21 so you're, tw- 22. So you're 21 years old. And how does a 21 year old come up with the money to buy a duplex? What, what was the, what was the capital stack like and where were you getting the, uh, the money from? For sure. So, you know, a lot of people get discouraged if they don't qualify conventional for conventional financing, right? If you don't, if you don't have two years of the same 1099, if you don't have like a W-2 that pays high enough to whatever your area requires, you know, a lot of markets are more expensive than where I'm at. <laughs> so I used hard money, which basically if you have a decent credit score, if you got like 20K in the bank and you got a heartbeat, they'll get you the money. It's high <laughs> interest. <laughs> So, you know, it's 13%, it's a couple points, it's interest payments every month. You know, you got you got to get your stuff together, but it's a really good tool if used correctly in the beginning to scale and to be able to buy real estate when you don't have, you know, the correct qualifications to me for conventional financing. Got it. So you you used hard money and uh how how does someone go about like if like let's say that someone is like okay well like how do i do like where can they find a hard money lender what what are some resources for them to like go out there and find hard money yeah i mean i would say you know check like bigger pockets that might be posting on like facebook or linkedin things like that I, you know i built up a network of some of them at this point so like you know realtors will probably should have them if they're investment friendly you should ask them um, ideally mm-hmm. it's been a lender that they've actually used themselves too. So they have like an even bigger layer of experience to share with you. Okay. So you use bigger pockets. Is that like a free, so like, is that a free resource? Do you have to pay for bigger pockets or can you like find all that information on the, on like the free version of the site? It's all free. Yeah. Okay. Nice. So yeah. And just to add to that too, like, I think that you know, definitely asking your, you know, asking agents or whatever, like if they know of hard money lenders, the good ones will. I think Bigger Pockets is, is a phenomenal resource. Like also Google, <laughs> like yeah, yeah, literally Google. Google hard money lenders and like uh, tons of answers will come up. Now, I do agree with you, Josh, like you should probably do some vetting and probably better to work with people that have worked with people that you know in the past, right? Even if the rate might be a little higher. Um, it, it's good to work with people that, you know, and also realize that everything's negotiable. So if you're, uh, if you're talking to someone, they, uh, they recommend you a hard money lender, you go find another one on Google. That one's offering you something for like one or two points less, uh, go back to the original one and be like, Hey, I really want to work with you. You were referred to me, but someone else is giving me a better rate. You know, can you match it? And a lot of times they will, you know, sometimes they won't, but it doesn't hurt to ask. Right. So uh, speaking of which, how have you, um, you know, since that time, if you stuck with hard money, are you using other financing sources and, and how do you go, how, you, how do you go about Josh, uh, negotiating those financing options? Definitely. Um, I'm, at this point, you know, I'm very heavy, hard money still. So I actually can't qualify for conventional lending yet. I will in April when I have the second year of the same income, but, um, <laughs> Yeah, it's been, you know, at this point, cash for properties under 100K and then a little bit of private money and hard money for anything over that. And just all value adds for the most part. So lots of renovations, lots of headaches, lots of fun. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, that's that's not atypical, you know. And and by the way, like, here's here's something that I want to add. Josh, you're, you're in a market where the price points are kind of in that, like, right, like 80 to 250 range, I'm assuming. Kind of in yeah. that, in that yeah. ballpark. Right. So my market's like the average sales price is like 1.2. You know, um, now when I was 23, <laughs> the average sales price is like 850. Right. So it's, it's gone up dramatically. But, but, but the truth is, is like even in those markets, you can still do the, you can still do these deals. Now you're not going to do as many of them. All right. But you don't have to do as many of them in order to kind of net the same amount. So you can still find hard money. Now, the other thing too, is that a young guy like you, if you had chosen to go into a market that's more expensive, maybe the only other thing, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe the only other thing that you would have had to find is some sort of capital partner or someone who has, you know, a, a decent amount of money, has a, you know, a, a bank role or some sort of like personal financial statement that they can show to kind of back you up and then you can go in on it together, right? Um, but you're yep. doing the legwork, the sweat equity, they're providing the check equity, but it's still possible. And that's what I want people to understand. And, and uh, I'm not sure if you've interfaced or talked with anyone 
that is uh, that has gone that route in a more expensive market. Um, would love to hear if that's if you've if you've had that experience or talk to people that that have had that sort of experience and what their strategies were. I have not, but I'll touch on something else that you're talking about. You know, especially if you're newer, if you don't have a ton of money, right? I think there's really three pillars to scaling and getting deals in real estate. Number one, I think, is knowledge, which anyone can get. If you don't have it yet, you just got to read. You got to talk to people in your market, go to local groups, you know, listen to investors in your area, look at sales comparables, rent comparables, start making connections, find lenders, title companies, et cetera. If you know everyone and you know all the prices, people will bring deals to you because you're going to be able to make connections and get things done. Even if you don't find deals, if you just know everyone, you can get there slowly, but you know, it'll it'll pay off dramatically. I think number two is the deals, right? That's the one that I decided to go after in the beginning. Cool calling. Straight to the owner, banging the phones, trying to make things happen. One to four units in my market. And I think very similar in other markets. You know, it's really hard to get a 20 unit if you don't know anything and you just call the investor because they're probably pretty sophisticated. But you can call it any single family owner, right? Or a duplex owner. And they're more likely to talk to you if compared to somebody that's super sophisticated. You don't have to be crazy or anything like that. And then I think the third pillar, obviously, is money. If you have money, people will bring deals to you. So love it, man. Yeah, that, those are some really valuable insights. And, and I would agree, like, you know, if you have, even if you have one of those three, you can do deals in real estate. Right? If you can, if you have two of those three, then you can do those deals in real estate and likely have a lot more leverage, right? And if you have three of all three of those, then yeah, you're like cooking, right? But uh, yeah, even if you can bring one of those three to the table, you can participate in deals in some capacity, right? Like, um, I think one of the biggest mistakes that I made as a um, as an agent when I was younger is I was chasing commissions. And I wasn't really thinking about taking equity in deals. Um, have you, has there been a time in your uh, young career now as a, as a real estate agent where you have foregone commission or, or chipped in commission in deals with investor clients of yours to take uh, upside on like the equity play? Have you negotiated anything like that with any of your investor clients? Yeah. So I haven't really investigated or sorry, I haven't invested in like any syndications at this point. So I haven't done any like GPs or things like that. But, mm-hmm. you know, if I have an investor that's consistently buying with me, you know, I'll cut the commission sometimes to get the deals done or on the back end sale or whatever, because I kind of value the relationship more than the immediate cash. That's on the realtor side. And then on the investor mm-hmm. side, the uh, my other partners are realtors as well. And we don't really take commissions on any of our purchases or sales. So right. that kind of doubles the margins on all of our transactions moving forward. And that helps the equity position as well. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. And that's kind of what I was getting at is that if you're the one, for example, bringing the deals, right? Um, a lot of times realtors think like, okay, I bring my investor the deal and I make a commission, but I would, I would encourage all agents to think outside the box and be like, Hey, how can I negotiate? Hey, I'm bringing you this deal. I would like commission plus 5% equity plus 10% equity. See what you can negotiate because these are things that, you know, might not seem like a big deal, but you're like, oh, well, you know, it's a, maybe the, the equity play is like, you know, 50 grand. Well, negotiating a five, uh, you know, a 5% equity play on that, that's an extra $2,500. And it also ties you in more with that investor, for example, right? Like just kind of spitballing with you here. If you've got that, if you've got that equity play, and you're like, hey, like I'm gonna maybe maybe I'll maybe I'll invest 500 or like a thousand of my commission into this deal, right? But I want a 10% equity play. Okay. Now here's the cool thing: when we go to sell it, because right, I'm assuming that these are flip deals, right? If they're not flip deals, <laughs> then maybe this doesn't work, right? Uh, but if it's a flip deal, then say, hey, like I'm gonna I'm gonna relist it. We'll like we'll cut the commissions on the on the on the listing, right? As well. Um, but now I'm a 10% equity player. And now I'm even more incentivized to get you the highest possible price because the more you, right? So like now yeah, I'm a of true course. equity partner in the deal. And um, dude, I wish, I wish I had done that when I was younger because I, I helped a lot of flippers and I made them a lot of money. And, and the only thing that I have to show for it are the commissions that I made. But if I was smarter, wiser, there's a lot of agents that do that. They might, they're not, they don't advertise it. Right. Like these agents don't advertise that they're doing this with their investor clients, but I promise you 
the best ones then the like the savviest ones absolutely are because if you have access to those deals uh there's a price to pay for that and it's not just in the form of commission at least not in my opinion i like that that's smart yeah Yeah, man you know you got you should do it bro like you're (laughs) young man you just tell them hey listen i got access to all these deals but it's gonna cost you and it's not just commission you know so the annoying uh, thing is just the paperwork that's what that's what i would drive a little nuts but i think in the beginning that's that's huge. You know, you can stack those up. You put 10 of those together and you can take all that equity and buy your own house yourself. Yep. hundred percent, hundred percent. So let's switch gears a little bit. I want to talk about numbers, understanding deals and, and really being able to, to analyze a deal and understand whether or not it's a good deal, you know, and typically this takes a lot of practice, a lot of training. So how does someone as young as yourself in such a little amount of time go from novice, right? Um, Because at some point you were a novice to being able to to analyze and look at deals and understand them at a high level. Um, How did you develop that ability at such a young age? I honestly just really, really, really focused on sales comparables and tried to figure out in, in this market, you know, what things are important, garages, number of bedrooms, square footage, layouts, where it is on the street, driveway, no driveway, parcel size, like all that stuff. And I, over time, like pretty quickly picked up on those changes. And as an investor, if you find a deal that you got to renovate and you really know the sales comparables, you really lower your risk in terms of where your ARV is going to be, where your sale price is going to be. You know, the biggest condition, as long as you actually get the property to that standard, in terms of renovation quality, as long as you can get it there and you really know the comps, like it's just, it's bread and butter. You just keep doing it over and over again. It's pretty passive. Like, you know, I'm doing, I don't know, probably like my 70th deal or something at this point. And it's like, it's the same deal I did the first time. I just have done it over and over and you can shrink your analysis time by, by a hundred, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you actually talked about that a little bit at the beginning. I'm glad that we kind of circled back around to it. You use the word expert and and I think that you know, expertise isn't necessarily defined by the time frame that you've been doing something, but rather the amount of hours that you've put in and the in the amount of time that you that you've been around. So, you can really accelerate your expertise by doing what you just described, which is, you know, becoming a student of the game. And um and that's interesting that you, you know, kind of embrace this idea of becoming a student super early on in your career because clearly it's paid dividends and you know, comps are comps, dude. Like anyone can pull those. It doesn't take a lot of work to do that. It does take time though. You know, it, it takes, it, it doesn't oh, take yeah. like a lot of, I should say like skill or whatever, but it does take a lot of time. And that, and that time develops into um, the ability to, to kind of look at things at, at a higher level and, and, and then it does become a skill, you know? So that's interesting, man. So <laughs> you talk about this hybrid wholesaling methodology and I, I want to understand what you mean by that and share you know what that what that looks like at a high level with the audience yeah so it's basically the typical wholesale method but instead of me putting the property under contract I just take all the information you know pictures videos rent information information on the roof the capex etc I package that together and then I present that to the investor investors that I'm working with and then if they like the opportunity and they want to offer on it, I just write up a contract, present the offer to the seller, and then they'll accept or deny or counter or whatever the case may be. But it's a lot more ethical, at least in the state of Ohio, because uh, you're really not supposed to wholesale as a licensed agent to other, mm-hmm. you're not supposed to do it general, but you can't really represent someone if you're wholesaling the property to them. In this right. case, I'm just presenting them an opportunity and sticking my standard commission in there that's just same thing over and over again, and I can represent them. That's awesome. So you're you're kind of using uh, your cold calling then to do a couple of things. You're 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 vetting the properties. You're like, okay, like is this a deal that I want to do? If it is, great. But if not, then let me take some pictures, everything, and and uh, I'll come back. You know, that's a really great strategy, man. How many of those appointments? do you go on per week? And what would you say that your average conversion ratio is? Either you buying the property or you being able to successfully hybrid wholesale it to an investor. So when it was just me cold calling, 
No, mm-hmm. I didn't have any notes on my team. Let's say for every 10 properties that I got good information on, the seller would take a price and it was within a reasonable range where somebody might offer something close or asking, yeah. I don't know, maybe I'd buy one and then I'd mm-hmm. sell like two, something okay. like that. And then the so other 30%, seven- 30%, basically, like 30% of the ones that you got inside the door, you either yeah. bought them or someone else bought and them. And there was another- thousand that didn't get in the door because yeah, it's yeah. hard to convert <laughs> someone over a cold call in the beginning. One out, so one out of 30, you convert, or one out of 10, you convert, two out of 10, you go and you pitch it to your wholesalers or your your investors. Now, like this question just comes up in my mind naturally, right? Like, well, what if, you know, what if the investor cuts, tries to cut you out of the deal, right? Like, what if you give them all the information and then all of a sudden they're like, gotcha, Josh, right? So- yeah, that, that's definitely a risk. So, uh, you know, I had an attorney construct a buyer agreement. It's not exclusive. It's the big thing I tell everyone in the beginning. I'm not trying to lock you up right away. It just says that you're going to use me as an agent for any deals that I present you in this manner. So, mm, um, gotcha. that that works. I, I have not had anybody cut me out out of okay. 400 almost. You've done how many? Uh, I've done... Around three, I've sold around 350, 350 first two houses years. in your first two years. Yeah. Oh my goodness, Josh, dude, like, let's talk about that for a second. You sold 350 houses in 24 months. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 2022 was around 130. And then, uh, last year was like right around 200. Holy cow. And then you're also investing in deals. You're also going on all these podcasts. Dude, like uh, that is, that is tremendous. Now, are you doing this all yourself? Do you have a team now that goes out and helps you? Like, what does that look like? The, the, the infrastructure of your, of your company or your team? Yeah. I mean, you might laugh. It's, it's pretty much me and two virtual assistants that kind of run the majority (laughs) of the show. (laughs) And then, you know, I have people that help find deals and then I have a property manager for my properties. And then I have contractors. I don't contract you know, I don't, I'm not out there swinging hammer and doing things like that, but Mm -hmm. you know, the core administration, communication, putting deals together, it's, you know, I basically use my computer science background to build procedures really tight. I, I have decent follow-up systems put in place and I just, between me two virtual assistants, we can, we can put it together. All right. So now I need to know, let, let's walk through like the typical life cycle. Let's just say that this is something that you're, that you're hybrid wholesaling or that you're selling to your clients or whatever. Cause I have to imagine that like for every deal you do yourself, you're probably selling like four to five houses at least. Right. Um, so the majority of them you're selling off either buyers or you're, you're doing like, yeah. so, no. So does the 350 include like, for example, if I put a buyer and seller together, uh, like kind those of what just, you just described. Th- those are just houses. So yeah, yeah I, I actually, I dual rep most of them, but it's, it's like 350 individual houses that I sold. I didn't buy. Okay. Got to. So, oh, so 350 that you've sold, not purchased yourself and one house counts as one transaction. You don't count those as two sites. Yeah. 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 Otherwise it'd be like 600 or something. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Wow. All right. So let's just, let's just back up here for a second. If I'm, um, uh, one of these, uh, you know, sellers that you're working with right now from the initial contact through the time that you get, that you close the deal, walk me through like a typical life cycle. Like you go, like you, you call them. I'm assuming that you have like some sort of like maybe pre-listing packet or like something that you delivered to your door. Um, And of course I understand that it varies for every single person or for every single seller, but like Walk me through what that typical process looks like, how many touch points and everything it requires, including follow-ups. So if like, you know, I would love to know just kind of like what that, what the average life cycle looks like. Yeah. So my uh, prospecting has really evolved since I started. So I'll kind of like talk about when I was in the phase of doing zero to five deals a month, there's zero to three deals a month even, Mm -hmm. right? That's just, I'm just pulling a list of 500 homes in a given area, 250 homes, hitting them. And, you know, I'd put them in like a hot category, uh, you know, medium or a cold based on my conversation. A hot guy has a price, 
and he's going to give me pictures t- tonight or tomorrow. A medium guy, you know, he knows his rents. He gave me his information. And what I'm saying now generally occurs over the course of the first one to three calls. Um, you know, the hot person I'm going to follow up with almost every single day. The the medium person, when I say follow up, I'm going to call them. If they don't answer, I'm going to have a use a text template. I have like 50 text templates that I use that all kind of gauge around the same thing, which is I'm interested. Give me this information that I don't have yet that you didn't yep. tell me that I'm waiting on. Uh, you know, the medium person I'll follow up with every week or every other week. And then the cold person, that's depending on how big of an investor they are. So, if you know, if he's got 30 homes and he's old, he doesn't want to sell to me now. <laughs> He probably wants to sell. He just doesn't want to sell with me. So I'll probably call that guy every two weeks or something like that and just try to build rapport, Mm -hmm. just figure out what he's trying to do. In the beginning, I think what really helped was I wasn't just trying to sell your home. I was like, hey, I'm coming out of college. I have some money saved. I see you bought this home. How did you get it? Right. I'm just trying to learn. And I Mm -hmm. came from a learning point and nobody really cold calls your home to learn how you bought it. They want to say, I'll pay 200K cash for it, right? And, right. you know, that kind of threw a lot of people off. And, you know, the old guys, something some investor told me was that I kind of, uh, you know, relied on was a lot of the really successful investors are kind of lonely because their friends did not do the same thing. And they're 50 mm-hmm. and 60 and they own all these homes and they make a bunch of cash flow and they're in a great spot but they have no one to talk about it with. Their family doesn't know the sophistications of it. Their friends are in the stock market or they have a W-2 or whatever the case may be. If you're a young kid and you're energized and you want to learn and you're willing to meet up with them even, like they're going to pour energy into you because they're looking for that. That's super interesting. And you know what? You're not the first person to that I've, I've spoken with who has kind of used that like backdoor approach, right? So instead of coming right out and asking like, are you going to sell your house to me? Will you sell your house to me? Pretty, pretty, please sell your house to me. It's more of like a, Hey, you know, just out of curiosity, I'm, I'm, I'm you, but 30 years younger, you know, how did you do it so that I can learn? That's a very interesting approach. How do you transition that conversation then? So it's, it, do you, do you meet up with them? Like, do you have like a coffee meeting? Um, are you just kind of following up with them, checking in every once in a while? Like, and, and, and how do you, if ever kind of transition or pivot the conversation from, uh, you know, educate me to, uh, let's do a deal together. Yeah. You know, the more I learn about their situation, their buying schedule, their life situation, I kind of make judgments based on that. You know, there's, if they're, their kids are already out of college and they're kind of settled, that's a long-term play. I'm not going to get anything done for six months, 12 months, maybe, but I'm going to really try to learn from them. I will try to meet with those guys. Right. Uh, you know, try to figure out their property managers or whoever is on their team. Something to note though, I think something that really helped with my Stanley success is I tried to never leave my desk ever. I never go to any properties. I don't even go to my own properties. I think you make the most money in the beginning when you're just on the phone trying to make shit happen roughly. (laughs) So, you know, I try not to uh, meet up with too many people I try to keep that selective. You have to really be like, you, know, you have to really be protective of your time as a realtor because mm. people will suck it up. Yeah, a hundred percent. So, so hold on a second. Cause now I'm like, you just kind of confirmed something that I was about to get to. So what you're telling me is that you sell these houses usually sight unseen. Yeah. So like I'll have somebody in my team bring a deal. If it makes sense, wow. I'll put, I'll put together a marketing package. I've already done mm-hmm. the due diligence. Somebody, somebody on my team or the seller took pictures. Somebody saw it at some point already, not me. Then I send it to the investor, have a conversation, get an offer into the seller, and then they have an inspection done. And I'll go to the inspections. They have an appraisal done. And I'll go to the appraisal, and then it closes. Yeah, I don't go to any properties ever. So if the so, so what you're saying is that you you either so through a series of phone calls, what I'm hearing. You take a, a cold lead, you get them to a point where they're giving you all the information that you need on the property, including pictures and a price. You then package that up into a little marketing thing. You you blast it out to a couple of your investors, or is it just one guy that you're working with super close at this point? Uh, no, no, it's I work with like 200 people. 
Okay, so you got a, a wide network of investors then that you're that you're basically blasting this package off to. And um, if any of them raise their hand and say, yes, I would like to go see it, or like, are they buying it sight unseen as well? Or are they tr- getting in there? Yeah. Or Okay, gotcha. M- most of them are out of state, so they don't live here. So they want I to see. send, you know, what, what I preach as a realtor, I think as an investment realtor, it's like, my job for you is to help you find properties and learn the area, mm-hmm. right? I can go to the property, take a video and things like that, but I'm not a contractor. I don't know if the roof's in bad shape or the walls are caving in, or if the furnace is bad, that's what yep. your inspector's for. So I try to preach who does what job. I'm just going to do this role that I established in the beginning and really yes. get very little pushback. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So then at that point, you uh, the investor says, I'd like to offer this much. You write up the contract, you present it to the seller via phone, right? Um, and then they're either going to be like, yes, no, I'll think about it there's some negotiating back and forth and then they accept the contract. And then at that point, your, your, your due diligence or your, your inspection period begins, correct? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So that is, um, that is insane, dude. I mean, honestly, like that's awesome. And like, I think that's brilliant. Also, like I've, n- I don't think I've ever heard of anyone being that efficient and that streamlined when it comes to just like taking listings. Cause what you're doing is basically you're matching these two buyers. that's completely off market. That's, um, that's phenomenal, man. That's brilliant. Good for you. I love Thank it, you. dude. And like, <laughs> and like when you're off it. market, like you, you're the only agent involved, so you make more money, which is great. But yeah. I like that. But what I really like is things go a lot smoother. There's no sure. other agent that you got to have some like bully or ego or weird thing going on. It's more relationship based. And, you know, there's off market sellers I consistently work with and I can talk to the investors. I'll be like, dude, this would be like the sixth home I've sold, I've sold from this guy off market. Like, you could talk to the other people that bought the other ones. They're doing good. And, you know, it's it's honestly pretty smooth. I want to go back to something that you just said because we glossed over it because I got excited, but I want to go back to it is you can make the most money by staying at your desk and and devoid of any distraction. I think that's so important and so powerful and something that, you know, honestly, I think that a lot of agents could learn from and people who are investors too. Like if you're, if you're trying to source deals yourself, what Josh is doing, by the way, agents can use, investors can use wholesalers. Like this is a methodology, a practice that basically anyone who has any interest in investing in real estate can leverage and utilize. So I think that's awesome. Um, Wow. That's amazing, man. Super, uh, super glad that we that we got to explore that because I wasn't even planning on on kind of diving into how you piece together those deals, but like that's pretty impressive. So I have to imagine that at this point you've got some pretty good systems dialed in in terms of like, you know, you get your like the sellers send you all this information. Your VAs probably are the ones that are putting like the you know offering memorandum for lack of a better word or like the package together to like blast out to your to your people. So you've got a pretty dialed in system. It sounds like to where. You're on the phone how many hours a, a, a day now at this point? I haven't cold called for like a year consistently. I mean, my um, role at this point is basically call the buyers that are really interested and, in, you know, if it makes sense for them, try to get them a contract. And if I got a seller on the fence, call them and try to use the skills that I built up to get them on the same page if it makes sense for them. So what I'm hearing is that you have, for a year, you did a bunch of cold calls and those cold calls have uh, created a, a, a big enough database to where now you can just put these deals together without having to make any more cold calls. Yeah, because especially off market, you know, if you do a deal with a seller and it goes well, you know, they might sell you their next home. They probably got a guy uh-huh. or a friend, or somebody in their family that wants to do the same thing. And it yep. just it just spreads like wildfire, and uh, you, but the thing is, you got to bring them good buyers. So in the beginning, right. when my first ten deals fell out. I brought them bad buyers, and I got bit, and I lost some relationships. But you know, it, that's why it's really important to vet your buyers. If you are a real estate agent listening to this right now, and you're thinking to yourself, "How the hell am I going to overcome this new commission lawsuit?" and like, "How am I going to con- continue to conduct business?" Uh, with this new commission lawsuit, um, listen to what Josh just just described like 50 times over and go do it. You know, go do, listen to it enough times until it inspires you into action because that's exactly the kind of methodology. It's exactly the kind of business practice that's going to protect you 
from, you know, becoming a quote unquote victim. I don't believe in being a victim, but some people uh, obviously do becoming a victim to the uh, to the new rules that are going to be in place uh, following these uh, commission lawsuits. Because, dude, you've just insulated yourself from any sort of your, your business is protected, like the way that you've structured it and built it now, like that shit doesn't that shit won't affect you whatsoever. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. It's because it's like, it, you know, if you want to pay commission, you won't get any deals. Someone else wants the deal, and they know I bring the deals. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I, I think it's a very, very, very repeatable model. I don't think this is like something that this one-off weird thing that I'm doing that no one else can do. And I know because I've been, I've been training people, and they're doing the same thing, and they're scaling up, and they're doing the same same thing. That's amazing, man. So when you're, um, when you're talking to these, uh, you know, these end, uh, or th- these sellers, right? These owners, are you more targeting the owners who have, cause you said they have multiple properties. So are you're, you're, are you targeting a lot of investment properties and is that like the, the main, uh, focus? Uh, you're, you're all investors. Yeah. I don't okay. really work with people that buy their primary home. And okay. the reason why they own multiple is just cause the homes are cheaper here. You know, mm-hmm. it's, you got a yeah. lot of money to buy five homes in your market. Here, yeah. it's not that hard if you do it over 10 years. <laughs> yeah, 100%. 100%. No, and and, and yeah. by the way, like that that makes a lot of sense to me. So, I think the next the next step is like, okay, how how do you how do you replicate this in a uh, and 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 honestly, there there are ways to replicate it if you can segment out lists for people that have owned their home for more than 15 and 20 years. You know, you'd probably find a lot of people who would also be uh, willing to do something similar because, you know, in my experience, at least if someone's owned for that long, they typically, their kids are out of the, you know, the kids are out of the house. A lot of these houses have been owned for so long. There's like kind of like quarter houses. They're not fit to be, uh, they're, they're not fit to be, to be sold. You know, the, you know, the take some pictures, put up some state, you know, put some staging up, put, take some pictures and, and put it on MLS kind of thing. Um, a lot of these properties are actually ripe for, for deals like this. So I'd be curious how, uh, you know, if someone listens to this podcast episode and, and, and kind of deploys that and, and adds, you know, those, those basically like lifers in the home, obviously there's some people that are going to die where they, uh, where they, uh, where they own, but there's, there's a subset of those individuals or those, those primary residence owners that, um, that do sell, you know, after they've lived in the home for like 15, 20 years, have a a decent amount of equity, but not too much. If they own it outright, they're not going to sell it. But if it's like, you know, 20% equity to like 50 or 60 and they've lived there for 20 plus years, chances are they've been pulling out some equity and they're going to need to sell at some point. Yeah. And and I think a really simple way to pull motivation if, if you're struggling is go to the local auditor that has all the records of all the sales. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if that's that's how they call it in my area. Just look, every single home has been sold at least once, basically. Some of them have been sold 20 times. At some point, every home will sell at some point. Right. So it's your job to just be there. And if you can talk to his, if you can talk to everyone in your market and everyone knows you, you'll sell everything. Just get as close as you can to there. And the best way to do that is to get on the phones, in my opinion. 100%. So Josh, we're, we're coming up on time here. want to be... Uh want to be respectful here of your time. I've got a couple questions here. The, the uh, One of the last ones here is uh, what are you seeing in the market right now? And and what are your plans uh, for 2024, both on the sales side of things and then also on the investment side of things? Fair. Uh, I think, you know, 2023, this was the stat that I was told it might not be true, was the least amount of homes sold when adjusted for population ever in American history. I think mm-hmm. for the last hundred years or something, I forget what the metrics were. I but, believe that. You know, I think it's going to go up. It's not going to be worse than that, especially with potentially rates coming down. So, you know, I think prices are probably going to go back up. A lot of buyers have been on the sidelines. So as a realtor, I'm just kind of doing the same thing I can't that I've been doing, trying to find more deals. Um, as an invest as an investor, I started a couple or two development companies that basically buy stuff, renovate it make a turnkey and then I sell it to my investors that want turnkey for one to four units. So I'm trying to double the production on those two companies. And uh, as just an investor, you know, my goal is to get to 250 units by the end of the year. So um, yeah. Dude, I love it, man. 
I love it, dude. No, that, that is, um, that's super inspiring, man, for, for, um, for anyone who's listening to this and, and it's to like 23 years old doing what you're doing right now, I, you know, and I'm sure that you would corroborate this. It's, it's, you just got to do the thing. And if you do the thing, like it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna happen now, obviously, like I can tell you're a polished dude. You've, um, you clearly give, you, you clearly give like a, an aura of confidence, which goes a long way when it comes, especially when it comes to listings and working with sellers, sellers gravitate. They just, it's like a magnet that confidence draws them in. But at some point, dude, you just got to do the work and that's what you've done. And, and the results are there. So, um, Congratulations, man. That's awesome. That's super Thank you. Awesome. Like when I started cold calling, you know, I was doing it like in my closet, almost at home. I was scared getting <laughs> yelled at. Like, you know, experience is huge. I've had like 50 people come into my office since the, the Bigger Pockets podcast that I went on locally. They're like, man, I saw you. Can I get involved? You know, I, I, yes. I show them here. Here's how to start. I'll give you a list. 45 of them didn't even do anything. And like a couple of them. Yeah. stuck to it for at least a reasonable amount of time, man. Like if you stick to it, I think it'll pay off. hundred percent. Well, in typical gold mine fashion, Josh, we're going to have you leave the audience with one final gold nugget. I think in investing, if, you know, don't try to reinvent the wheel. If there's somebody in your market doing something that you want to do, just look at what they're doing and just repeat it. Don't try to do something crazy, crazy different. It's, it's, yeah. I love that. I love it. Uh, if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And if it works for them, it'll work for you. That's awesome, yep. brother. That's awesome. Josh, thanks for stopping by, man. It was a pleasure. Thank you. I appreciate it.